Amen, my brothers. How are we doing this evening? Amen. Well, I am fired up to get into God's word here this evening. You know, I don't know how your week's been, but my week's been crazy. And I'm having a good time walking with God and working for God. I mean, it's been incredible to see what God has done through his people in just one month. I mean, to see 50 additions in one month, the most fruitful month of all the history. I mean, God is moving. Is that fire you guys up? All right, all right, all right. Well, let's turn our Bibles over to Revelation 12. You know, in Revelation 12, you know, in the midst of so much triumph and all that God is doing within the kingdom, you got to expect, I mean, so much great things are happening. 50 souls have come to Christ. Then we got the missions. I mean, we blew out our special missions. So we were willing to sacrifice while all pushing ourselves to help God's kingdom really grow. But we got to understand just how infuriating it is for Satan to see a group of men amass on a Wednesday night and said, you know what? 50 editions was awesome, but we're not done yet. We're just getting started. I want more. I want to continue to fight for the souls. Satan right now is, has, has, is having his own midweek right now. He's got his own little mass, his little leadership team ready to commission and attack and tear down anything that we would hope to do. Revelation 12, verse 7. I'll lower the mic. It says in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. He has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their life so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. Oh, but woe to you who live on the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you and he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Drop down to verse 17. It says, Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. What an incredible wild even, passage of scripture that gives us a vision of actually what took place. You see, here it teaches, if you read the preceding verses, it actually talks about how there was this dragon and there was this woman who had 12 stars around as a crown and that that woman was to represent the people of God. And then it says that this woman gave birth to a child, a male child. We understand that to represent Jesus. And then it says that the dragon, it says that this dragon was infuriated and tried to attack the woman. But God would take care of the woman for a time's time and a half a time. And time's time and a half a time is, we we understand this from other biblical passages, that is to represent the time in which evil would be allowed to reign. But we understand also from this same passage, I'm not going to get all into it because there's a lot of language in there. But what it teaches is that in that time, time and a half a time, that God would protect his people in the midst of all of this. But we see here the dragon, when it was hurled down the earth, it says that with his tail, it swiped out a third of the stars. The stars are to represent angels. 
And so when Satan got cast out of heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. Meaning that Satan's army is not small. It's a third of all of the hosts that are surrounding God even right now. But then it says, excitingly, that even though that this dragon tried to fight against God and the angels, it said Michael and his angels triumphed over the devil and he was hurled down to earth. And it says, rejoice, you heavens. And man, when we look at the scripture, we're like, yeah. But that's not about you. (laughs) See, it says, woe to you who are on the earth. Woe to you that live here because this is now no longer just the SDA building that we use on a Wednesday night. This is the dominion of darkness. This is Satan's very domain. And what does the scripture say? It says that he's made it his obligation to make war against all of the offspring of God. It says that he's come down to earth. And it says he came to have a good old fight with us. Title of my lesson tonight is, let's fight with the devil. Revelation 12, in verse 10, the Bible says here, it says, then I heard a loud voice. In heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ, for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. You see, when Satan was hurled down, he didn't just make it his his duty just to do a couple of bad things and a couple of bad deeds. No, it says that his efforts, his focus, his energy, his dire need is to simply accuse every disciple. Day and night. My first point for you is silence the accuser. You know, in Job, it's incredible. I mean, I think the Bible is so awesome because it gives you these depictions. Before this whole occurrence happened, Satan actually had the platform to go before God and accuse men and women of the Old Testament in the presence of God. Because there was no mediator between man and God at the time. It was simply Satan able to go and accuse men and women that were pursuing to be righteous. And so what it teaches in Job, it's incredible because he goes before God and says, Hey, you know, um, I, I, I think that, you know, you're too good to these people. And God's like, I got, I got an idea. I just, it's a solid idea. Have you considered Esteban? Like, you just considered him. You just thought about Esteban? But he says, have you considered my servant Job? He's more righteous than everybody. I I know who we're not thinking about. We're not thinking about Ole when we think about that scripture. (laughs) Oh, definitely talking about Ole right here, Ole Inca or Adola. (laughs) But it says that Satan came to accuse Job. To God. But then we understand, turn over to Colossians 2. Because he no longer has that platform. How do we know? We're going to look at Colossians 2 here. Colossians 2, in verse 13. It says here, when you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having concealed the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. What the scripture teaches us is that beforehand, Satan had this ability to go directly before God, but as soon as Jesus took on the cross, died for our sins and resurrected, now we have a mediator. And so now all of that was written in the past, all the sinful nature that we had in Christ, it's totally wiped away. 
And so Satan no longer has that platform to directly accuse us any longer. It says the, the Bible doesn't allow him in the presence of God, but he did hurl him down here to earth. Because Satan's no longer trying to accuse you to God. Now he's trying to accuse you to your face. He's employed and deployed all of his demonic uh, uh, d demons to us. And every day he's trying to strip, of us, strip us of our confidence yeah. so that we too will feel yeah. and allow those accusations to be louder yeah. than the very words of God. Yeah. So we say this, man, like that's such a dark situation. We got a little silent because I think it's a, it's a little tough to hear. You know, like, dude, I feel accused right now. I'm having a hard time right now. Do you not understand what I'm going through? I woke up accused. I went to work accused. I went to school accused. I just feel accused all the time. Tell me how do I silence the accuser? What well, says in Revelation, I mean, I'm sorry. It says in 2 Peter 1, let's turn over there. Second Peter chapter 1. It says in verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his past sins. It says here that after you got your faith, after you became a disciple, it says that it's no, it's not okay for you to just stay there. And then it lists off everything ultimately to get into love, but it says if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, Meaning that you can't even stop there. You have to go, you have to grow more and more, do more and more, and excel at all costs. This is why Psalm 84 says you got to go from strength to strength till when? Till you appear before God in Zion. Until you get to heaven. So this life cannot be a life of you just staying stagnant and thinking that it's okay to just, man, my greatest days, my greatest quiet times were when I got baptized and I was studying out the book of John. Or it was when I was doing the 40 days packing and I was just learning these little cookie cutter quiet times to give me the rhythm. That can't be the moment of our greatest knowledge. It says everything has got to go higher and higher, more and more. It's no longer enough. Our glory days are not behind us, but they are before us, my brothers. You know, this scripture is a response of how to silence the accuser, how to silence Satan. Because Satan is actually the greatest narcissist in all of existence. He desires to receive attention. And so instead of focusing so much on trying to combat the accusations, you've got to get focused on growing in your knowledge of God, your knowledge of Jesus. Why? Because the best way to silence a narcissist is you simply ignore them. A narcissist loves attention. They need everything to revolve around them. And right now, let me tell you, Satan is accusing you because he just wants you to give him so much attention. Have you given Satan some attention? You know, I think what Satan's ultimate goal is, sometimes it's not even to get you to not sit in one of these seats. It's to just get you to sit in one of these seats and walk out of here unchanged. It's simply to fill up a seat. 
It's simply just to be here and say, I've been present for 10 years. But yeah, is that all you've been? Is you've just been present for 10 years? But you haven't grown in 10 years. You're fundamentally the same person you were 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, six months ago. This is, the, guys, I'm just saying, this is a fight with the devil. I'm just trying to be equipped. I just want to be able to say that I'm increasing in my knowledge of God so that I can be with God one day. That's the only reason. I just don't want to stop growing. You man, I get insecure when I stop growing. When I sense an, an inch where I'm like, I just feel like I'm the same person yesterday. Something's got to happen. Something's got to happen. I'm addicted to growing. I'm addicted to doing more. I want to I wanna be greater for God. I want to be used more by God. But the only way that happens is if you constantly invest and constantly give yourself over to learning more. Silence the accuser. You know, I, uh, I got accused a lot as a kid. Um, I uh, had a little sister. And um, we would get into arguments. She was like my best friend growing up. So we would, uh, we would cook together. We would do all these things. Like in the morning, we would annoy my, little, my older sister. And we would go in a room. We would like throw cards up in the air and run out of the room. I mean, we'd be like, we'd get in trouble together, to be honest with you. It was, it was really awesome. It's funny, I get the opportunity every other week to take care of my little nephew, which is her son. Um, so it just really brought us back and bonded us together. But honestly, in, in a great way, she was my best friend, but she was my greatest accuser. <laughs> she would annoy. You know, accusations are just annoying. Like, when you get accused of something, it's just like, it's naggy. It's like you're constantly hearing the same thing beating in your ear. You're not good enough. You suck. But what my sister would do is something more effective. So we get into an argument, and I just, I just get quiet. And you know you're angry when, you're, when you just get quiet. And so what she would do, <laughs> what she would do is she would notice. I think she could feel it. And so she'd feel me trying to ignore her, and she'd be like, oh, you're mad? Oh, so you're mad. Oh, so you must be mad right now. See, I can see it on your face. You're angry. You're mad. And then I would get to a point, I'd just be so angry. I'm like, shut up! And I think, man, I did it, man. I shut her up. No, she gets louder. Oh, so you're really mad now. Now I really got you. You're so mad. And then she'd sometimes put on a cape and be like, hey, Matthew, what are you now? Super mad! It'd be hilarious! But I'd be so ticked, I'd be so angry. Man, and then, and then I think my cousins on my dad's side caught wind of this. And so my cousins, when they started, when I would get mad, they'd be like, princess, princess, you're a little princess, princess. And I, I realize that now I'm having a little PTSD. I'm, I got bullied by my family a lot. I, I, I got a... I got a journal. I got a journal about this tonight. Been very, I just been very accused. <laughs> but I learned something in the midst of all this. I learned that you know if I just get focused on everything but them, eventually they would just be quiet. If I don't focus on the accusations. My little sister would just get quiet. And I just, no, I'm actually, no, I'm fine. How are you doing, actually? I'm doing great. And just get focused on my day. Man, she would have nothing to say. And my brothers, it's the same thing with Satan. Instead of trying to say, no, I'm not. No, I'm, I am good enough. No, 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 no. Don't focus on what Satan has got going on in your ear. Focus on all the things that God wants you to go and do, that all the things that God wants you to go and accomplish. But here's the thing. How do you know if you fed into the accusations? Proverbs 18.9 says, one who is slack in his work is brother to the one who destroys. And we know from John 10.10 it says that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you become idle... When you become somebody who has not grown, 
you become a brother to Satan. I want to challenge the brothers. You know, you know, we 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 in this in the Metro Coast Super Region. Is this the Metro Coast Super Region? I'm be honest. I think there might be a lot of brothers who have allowed those accusations to put them in a state of lukewarmness. Where you've listened to the accusations more than you listen to God. Where you now feel because of the things that Satan has whispered in your ear, you feel justified in not having to do anything. Where you can just now you become an accuser and you're like, yeah, I see everything that's wrong with this place. And it's because your heart has gotten so hard. You're not able to hear and see what God is doing around you. Some of us can look at, you know, we're talking about, man, they're always talking about evangelism and, and sharing your faith. And, man, every time Aleem says that, I'm always sharing my faith at work, I just get angry. Man, I'm tired of them talking about evangelism. I'm tired of them talking about doing the work for God. Why don't we focus on something else? My Bible says that Jesus' purpose was to come and seek and save the lost. And if he is the head of the body, which is the church, then what should be the church's purpose? It should be seeking and saving the lost. So it's time for us that all the accusations that you face throughout the week and this evening, even walking in these doors, silence the accuser. Are you guys with me? Let's turn back to Revelation 12. Revelation 12 says in verse 11, in this fight with the devil, how are we going to overcome? How are we going to overcome? It says in verse 11, it says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. It says, how did they fight this fight? How did they persevere? How did they endure all that would come their way? How did they continue? And even in spite of all the things that were going on around them, it says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. It was their faith in what? That this fight was worth it. Why was it worth it? Because at the end of this, we get to go to heaven to be with God. And this is worth it. My brothers, I, I, mean, I got to ask you guys here this evening, is fighting for God and this fight in our life and going through all the, the gamut of denying yourself and fighting your sin, is it worth it to you? Yeah. Is it really something that you just look forward to, not because you want to just feel all the negative aspects of it, but because you see the worth that eventually, at the end of all this, I get to go to heaven. You know, there's a quote, it says, if there is no pain, there is no gain. If there is no cross, then there would be no crown. And if there is no fight, then there is no glory. My second point for you is the hope of glory. Turn over to Colossians 1. Colossians 1, part of this is, I just love fighting. In Colossians 1 and verse 24, it says here, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now to close to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom 
so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. What an incredible passage of scripture. It says that Paul, he filled up in his flesh. There was something that was still lacking on the cross. And it was the rest of the world actually having the opportunity to become true disciples. So he looked at this and said, this is my responsibility. It says, I labor and strive for this. I struggle. I suffer. I am in anguish for it. Because it's worth revealing the greatest mystery known to man. That Christ would no longer, or God would no longer want to live in a, in a temple and that he would be far from us, but he would want to live inside of us, giving us the hope that one day we'd all be in heaven with him. And so it said this hope, Paul says this hope of glory was something we had to suffer for. He says it's something we have to fight for. And in this fight with the devil, it's a constant combating back and forth against, is your hope still the hope of glory? Or is your hope in something else? You know, I, I had a D time with Christoph here. And uh, we, which is essentially, which is our mentoring time. I sit down and we look at a couple of scriptures, check and see how things are going. And he was having a hard time. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, Christoph was, uh, we were just talking. And, you know, he, I, he, was, he was having a little bit of a moment where he was like, man, I'm, I'm like, is this going to happen? He was, he's had a little faith issue right here. And I, I looked at Colossians, Colossians 1, and I said, bro, let me turn there here really quick. Small pages. Colossians 1 and verse 5. It says, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel, that has come to you. And I read the scripture, I was like, bro, like, when we're struggling with our faith, we begin to waver a little bit. It says your faith and love actually spring from a hope. What was that hope in? It was the hope to get to heaven. So when you got baptized, you were willing to, man, you were pushing, you were persevering, and it was all about one thing. Man, I get to go to heaven one day. This is awesome. And then I said, bro, maybe you're struggling with where you're putting your hope at. <laughs> and I said, you know what keeps us? Because he was unwilling to persevere and suffer for something. I was like, bro, you know what keeps us from our, uh, keeps us unwilling to actually fight and suffer for what this glorious hope is, it's our perspective on suffering. We look at suffering as a negative thing. We can look at suffering as a dark thing. It says in Romans 5, it says that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope that does not put us, and that does not disappoint. And so I said, that suffering that you're unwilling to go through is producing the very thing that you ultimately desire, hope. And I essentially said, I was like, you have a misplaced hope. Your hope is in this immediate thing, but God wants you to look at this as a temporary thing that's getting you to the ultimate goal. And we know that the only hope that really doesn't disappoint us is actually heaven. But where do we find ourselves putting our hope in? Where does hope actually come from? It comes from your desire. When we studied the Bible, when we sat down with the disciple and, man, we were looking at the scriptures, our desire was to be right with God so that we can go to heaven. Look over at Psalm 103. I think I shared this with Femi, too. Everybody's struggling. No. <laughs> We all struggling. Psalm 103, it says in verse 5, it says, Who satisfies your desires with good things 
so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So that desire that you have is where hope comes from. And it says that God wants to satisfy that desire with good things. Psalm 119 and verse 71 teaches, it says, it was good for me to be afflicted. It was good for me to suffer so that I might learn your decrees. So part of that goodness that God wants to give to us is actually suffering. And it's not suffering because he just wants you to have a hard time. Like, I just can't wait to see Michael Kirshner just struggle. Like, that's not why God does this. He does it because he wants us to focus on how much the hope is actually worth. It's worth the struggle. It's worth the affliction. It's worth the suffering. But then I said, but when we become unwilling to suffer, it's because we lost focus and our desires became less in the hope of heaven and more in the hope of other things. I think we have to consider what are those other things? Because as disciples, we can get so caught into, man, the kingdom and all these other things. And man, I can't wait to start dating. I can't wait to get a girlfriend. I can't wait to get married. I can't wait to get that job. I can't wait to be super successful so I can be financially stable and actually take care of my family that has been waiting for me to actually be successful my whole life. I can't wait. There's so much desire. And honestly, these things are not bad in and of themselves. But when that becomes the only thing your hope is in, in every way, it proves fleeting. It proves empty. Why? Because it's only going to last the lifetime you have here on earth. There's some of us that are studying the Bible that, you know, you see this and you're like, man, this is calling me to actually be radical and give up my old way of living. But I really value that way of living. And I always tell people when we're studying the Bible, I'm like, this is all a question of what you value. If you value just this life here on earth, then you'll suffer for just the things that are here on earth. But if you really value being with God in heaven one day, you'll suffer here on earth so you can lay hold of being in the very presence of God one day. Are you guys with me? You know, I, I preach this honestly because this is something that came up when I got here to L.A. I, I, I recognize in myself that I actually begin to struggle with the very things I struggled with as a non-Christian. I started to desire, man, for me, I idolized ideals, the ideal everything. Ideal girl, ideal life, ideal, ideal amount of money, ideal success, ideal respect. I wanted everything to be ideal. And you can even take this and baptize it into the kingdom to where you begin to struggle and desire things that God won't give to you. Why? Because it'll be the very thing that takes you out for the thing you should hope for, which is being with God. And so somebody asked, man, why, why ain't God give me a girlfriend yet? Because you'd make that girl your idol. Why haven't he give you marriage? Because instead of focusing on your marriage to the father, you'll be focused on your marriage to this gal, and you'll make her your God. Why hasn't God actually answered all my prayers of getting all the amount of success that I want? Because it'll be the very thing that strips you away from God. Sometimes God, God allows you to suffer in these different arenas of saying no, because he actually loves you enough to protect you even from yourself. You know, I say that because being in the ministry, people could think, you know, like, man, these guys don't struggle. Like, this is fine. Everything's good. No, no, no. You take these same desires and you just baptize them and make them hyper spiritual. So instead of getting solely focused on pleasing God, you can want to make yourself look good. You can make yourself want to look like a spectacle that people respect. Instead of being the guide that God intended you to be, you try to become the guru that has all the answers. And honestly, I noticed this stuff in my heart. I was walking home. So every day I walk to the gym, I prayer walk, I walk back and I prayer walk. And on the way back from the gym, 
I, I was thinking about, I was like, God, you have to be enough for me. This has to be enough. And I, when I see myself there, I go back to when I first became a disciple. If I had none of this stuff, because I had none of this stuff. And I didn't even think about it. Why? Because I had actually everything I really desired. I had God. And it broke my heart to tears. Because I was like, man, God, you are enough for me. I gave up everything. If I just have you at the end of this, then that's all that really matters. Because when I get to heaven, that's all I'm going to have is you. And so it challenged me a great deal. And I had to get open. I had to repent and just go back and say, God, if I lose all this, if I don't have any of this stuff, then so be it. But as long as I can appear before you one day, mold my heart, I'll endure the suffering. And you know what? When you do that, God, when you surrender, you surrender everything. You're like, it doesn't matter. It's all about getting to heaven one day. Then God blesses your life. He's like, you can actually handle, you won't abuse the gifts that I give you. You'll utilize them and bring more glory to my name. Because your hope is not in these things. Your hope is in the hope of glory. <laughs> Guys, this is going to be a fight. This is going to be a fight for the rest of our lives. I'm, all, I'm, I'm 26 years old. I'm, I just, I'm about to turn eight years old spiritually. I've been in the kingdom for eight years. Guys, but the fight has really just begun. Yeah. And so we've got to really ante back up because Satan at moments is going to try to put you in a corner. And he's going to try to yell in your ear so you can silence the voice of God, but you need to silence the accuser. Yeah. And then when everything in life, and God does bless you and he does give you these things, don't put all your hope in them. But allow it to give you the perspective that God has given me these things so I can give it back to him and I can utilize it for his glory. Because my hope is not in these things that are temporary. My hope is in the hope of glory. And so in this fight, I can do this. We can do this. We have the strength. We have the ability. We have God's word. And so instead of looking at this, this, this concept of fighting with the devil as something I'm reluctant to do, you can walk out of here and say, you know what? I'm ready to fight with the devil and to God be all the glory. Yeah.